History, they like to say, never repeats itself. But I can tell you, after 50 years of reporting, it often echoes with familiar refrains. Take Russia today, for example. This 88-year-old man keeps his energy by his attitude, by his passion for America, and by his passion for his work. He's a veteran reporter, and he was a hero to some of us and a mentor for many of us. Hello. I'm David Hoffman, filmmaker, and every once in a while I get the chance to talk with somebody, to interview somebody who's really affected my life. And this guy, Hedrick Smith, is one of those. You're about to see me ask him how he's done it. I mean, he's 88 years old, he's got his energy, his passion, his focus, and he's been a reporter for all of his adult life. Those of us young filmmakers, me, an independent documentary filmmaker, I'm not a reporter but I've talked to reporters and I've used reporters in a lot of my films. And as far as we saw it, one of the best was Hedrick. He was honest. He was in the tough places, like in the civil rights movement down south, when it was damn scary. He was in Russia, he was in Vietnam, and he was always reporting what he saw. It wasn't right or left, it wasn't politically acceptable, it was what he saw. And he was really good at it, and he kept on going to the tough spots. And we, kind of younger filmmakers, said, wow, that's a guy we admire. And you know, I get so many comments by people who don't trust the media, or trust it sort of, or only trust certain media. Well, Hendrick is one of those guys you could trust. You may not always have agreed with what he said, but he said what he saw. What was it like when you started desiring to be a reporter? What was the world like? America like, you like, and is it any different today? It's totally different. Totally different back then from the way it is now. Much more shoe leather reporting, getting out among the people. There were no tweets. There was no YouTube. There was no uh, internet. I mean, people can sit at their homes and report today. They don't even have to leave. Me, I grew up as a reporter who had to go out and see for myself. I had to talk to the people. I had to feel the story. I had to smell the story. I had to sense the story. I covered civil rights in the 1960s when, when Martin Luther King and John Lewis were just getting started. At the very beginning, I was there on the streets. I was in the drugstores. I watched the segregationists and the Jim Crow guys throw salt and throw stuff at them and pull them off the drugstore counters. I watched the dogs in Birmingham go after the demonstrators that Martin Luther King was leading in Birmingham. I saw it. I smelled it. I felt it. That's the kind of reporting that you got. Uh, today, it's kind of all like through a looking glass. It's, some of it's different. I mean, with the demonstrations after George Floyd got killed, that's back to the kind of reporting that I know that I felt uh, that we did back in the 1960s and 70s. People think that a reporter reports what he sees, basically reports what he sees. Do you report or did you report what you see or did you add your own personal feelings, like I would assume, your own judgments, your own opinions, your own politics? Back in the 60s, when I was covering civil rights, I was in and out of cities like Birmingham, Alabama, Jackson, Mississippi, Albany, Georgia, uh, deep south, where there were strong, passionate feelings of white supremacy and the civil rights protesters. I was very neutral. I covered the story right down the middle. I had to be able to go back into those uh, towns again and again. I had to be able to talk to the police chief as well as to the black door lawyers and the doctors and the people who were helping the demonstrators. So, and, and actually I worked for the New York Times and they had trouble sending reporters from the North down to the South because they would do just what you said. They were opinionated and they could never go back a second time. Me, I had to go back again and again and again. So being straight, being in the middle, covering both sides of the story was absolutely central to my ability to do the job. Did you grow up with a platinum spoon in your mouth? I mean, did you go to the best colleges? Where, what's your background that led you to be a reporter, to have these opportunities like reporting for the New York Times? David, I was really lucky. I was born on the road. I was born in Scotland. My family, my parents moved to Germany. I was in Germany when Hitler was rising in Germany. I moved then to France and to Spain in, during the Spanish Civil War. I was in England when the war began. When The war began for me, not with Pearl Harbor 
but with the King's speech. I remember I was a kid in a little, a little cottage in Buckinghamshire outside of London, and my mother said, stop. I was standing on the landing in this little house where I was, and I froze. My mother said, it's the king. And my parents were sitting there looking at this old-fashioned radio that's kind of shaped almost like a church cathedral. And they stood there, and I froze. We are at war. We're at war. England had declared war against Germany because of the German invasion of Poland. Uh, and that's where the war began with me. So I, and then, I mean, when I came to America, I came on one of the last two boats out of England in the war. We had never planned to come back. My father's father had a heart attack, had his own business, and my father had to come home and take over the business. We were supposed to be in England. I remember we looked for U-boats. We looked for the submarines on the way coming back. I've, I came back with my grandmother. We had to count the steps from our stateroom down underneath uh, in the ship all the way up to our lifeboat. We were assigned a lifeboat and we knew exactly we could do it 123 steps in the dark, up four stairways, this way, that way, and then to the lifeboat. So that's how I began, David. I began on the road. I began on the move. Life to me began as an adventure. And I think that's captured me for the rest of my life. I mean, my reporting has been an adventure. And then my mother's father was a famous Chicago attorney, but his dream was to be a country newspaper editor. He wanted to quit being a lawyer and go buy a little uh, country newspaper and uh, run it himself. And she talked to me about him. She idolized her father. I barely remember him. He died when I was about four or five years old. Uh, but she would tell me stories about him. And I think I got the bug from her. I, I think it was in me long before I realized it. I began to realize I was interested in journalism in high school. I ran the school newspaper. I got interested in uh, black journalism at that time. I got interested in the muckrakers, the famous uh, investigative reporters of the progressive era of the early 1900s. All that happened in high school. And if you asked me when I was 40, why did, I, why did I become a journalist? I would say because I fell in love with the muckrakers and those guys. And it's true. But I think the real thing that happened was that my mother unconsciously planted her father's dream in my psyche. And I've just loved it ever since. I've been so lucky. It's such a great way to live. It's always been so interesting to me. And, and you can hear it. I'm still alive, uh, kicking now, um, because what I've done has been so damn much fun. So you grew up with fear. If your grandmother is counting the steps, seems to me you know something I didn't know. I grew up in suburban Long Island, Levittown, we knew about the bomb, but we never actually saw anything. You know danger, fear, from a very early age. Is that affecting you? And, and did that affect you? I don't think that the fear inhibited me. I think that I just learned to incorporate it in my life. It was part of life. You know, I didn't grow up as an American with the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean on one side and all the enemies of the world until Russia came along with intercontinental missiles. There was no enemy that could touch us except Pearl Harbor, right? But when I grew up in Europe, in Germany, Hitler is arising in Spain in the Civil War. I'm a kid, so I'm not caught up in the adult world, but I live in a world where there is fear. So fear is part of my life. As, you know, and as a reporter, I've been afraid. I've been afraid for my life. I tell you, if any reporter is worth his salt and he's covered anything, and I've covered wars, and I've covered civil rights protests, uh, I've, covered all, I've covered the Soviet Union, I've dealt with dissidents, I've dealt with the KGB. Uh, anybody who tells you that they have not been afraid is either not being honest or they got ice water in their veins. Um, you know, it just, it isn't possible. I mean, I've been shot at. When, you, when you're on a helicopter, as I was in Vietnam, so you're in this helicopter and it's coming down to cover with fire the landing of some Vietnamese troops and you're looking over here and you're looking over there and you can see red, orange coming out of the trees. And there's a guy in the, in the door of your, of your helicopter and he's shooting an M, uh, M4, an M13, or whatever. It's an automatic weapon. And I'm sitting there and suddenly I, somebody slams something into my stomach and it's the GI next to me and he said, start loading. 
like loading what? I got a clip in front of me and the guy says, start putting bullets in it. And my head is saying, I'm not a combatant, I'm a reporter. And I start loading because this guy's saving my life out the door here. So anybody who tells you you've been, and you're seasick, the damn helicopter is going up and down. And anything a boat does on the water is nothing like what a helicopter does when it's doing evasive maneuvers. So anybody who tells you they haven't been scared and they've been a reporter, they must have been sitting in the room doing it all on the internet, okay? Because uh, you, you can't live through that without feeling it. On the other hand, you have to keep going. You, uh, you can't let that paralyze you. Um, so I think that's what I would say about fear, David. I would say that the fear is there. It's real. You have to be honest about it. And then you screw your courage to the sticking point and you go on. But you don't do dumb things. You don't do dumb things. I mean, one of the things I learned as a reporter in the Soviet Union and the KGB used to tell us and we could see them telling us, uh, or I learned it in the South during Jim Crow, uh, was you pretty much always went with another reporter or two. You were sort of protection for each other. You kept your eye for each other. And one day um, I was in Birmingham where the demonstrations were going on and I got a call. I was in my hotel. I'd gone to sleep in Birmingham and I get a call from the New York Times desk in New York at about midnight. And they say there's been a huge riot up in Gadsden. It's about 30, 40 miles north of Birmingham. Get up there and get us a story. This is at midnight, okay? So I get up there at about two o'clock in the morning. Uh, and I look around at the county courthouse where there've been demonstrations and there's litter all over the place, the signs of there's been, you know, some kind of melee. Uh, and I go to a, a couple of doctors whose uh, offices I know, and sure enough, they're, they're treating people with banged up heads and with elbows knocked up and one thing and another, you know, really hurt. Um, and uh, you know, I spent some time find out what's going on. It turned out the police arrested a whole bunch of people and they clubbed them and they kicked them around and that kind of stuff. So the next morning I go to the sheriff's office to look at the police blotter to find out how many people have been arrested and who's been arrested. And I'm there doing this and in walks the sheriff and with him is Al Lingo. Now he was the commander of the Alabama State Police a very mean, very nasty, very tough man. And I had seen him before, he knew me, I knew him. I'd interviewed him uh, down in Birmingham and that kind of stuff. And he walks around past me and he goes around me and he gets on the other side of the counter. And he looks at me and he says, Smith, you didn't make the mistake of coming up here to Gadsden all alone, did you? And I want to tell you, my throat lump went right up. I mean, it was a chilly moment. I said, no, no, my, he said, where are you buddies? I said, oh, they'll be alone. They're just out there. They were there. I was there alone. He was right. He spotted it. Yeah, my heart beat hard. Um, I was alone once down in Plaquemines Parish, down in the Bayou country of Louisiana, covering segregation down there. There was no other reporter along there with me. Everybody in town knew I was there. Everybody in town, in the restaurants, and the coffee shops, anywhere, knew there was a lone New York Times reporter there. And I spent the night in a the motel there. I was nervous the whole time I was there, David. I was nervous the whole time. I mean, I'd been in situations where I'd seen cops rough up uh, reporters as well as, uh, as, well as demonstrators. Uh, and uh, yeah, my heart beat fast. The reason you agreed to do this interview with me is because you're engaged in what you feel is a battle for the American democracy. Tell me about what changed in your lifetime that puts you in a place where at 87 years old, you're not retiring in the sun of Massachusetts or Florida or the Caribbean. You're fighting some kind of battle. What's driving that? I think I've always been drawn to the stories of the underdogs. I think I did that in Russia with the dissidents. I certainly did that in the civil rights period in America. But the story of the people, ordinary people, is something that just pulls at me. I'm drawn towards it. That's one thing. But the second thing is, David, we're in a battle for our lives to save our democracy. We have seen, you know, when I first started reporting in the 60s and 70s, the two parties used to work together. They passed budgets. Um, you know, if, if people disagreed, but when they got done with an election, they went back and they worked together and they compromised. We, we got the two parties are miles apart now. We have, we have political polarization. We got enormous amounts of money uh, flowing into our elections. You know, people don't know it, but in 1907, let me repeat that, in 1907, 
Congress banned corporate contributions to American political campaigns. They're going on right now because the Supreme Court decided in 2010 that, that political contributions, money was equal to speech and corporations were like people. That's a serious, serious change in our political system. And people understand that. And the underdogs, the people, the average folks, the grassroots heroes are starting to react to that. And I think it's a critical time for our democracy. There's a question whether or not rule of law, there's a question of whether or not fair elections as opposed to rigged elections, whether or not open voting is gonna survive. And what's fascinating to me is not that I discovered that, but all kinds of ordinary people discovered that. They found it out on themselves. They kept telling Washington again and again in one election after another, go fix our broken democracy, stop rigging elections, put limits on corporate money, put limits on billionaire money. And Washington did diddly squat. And finally people realized, oh my God, it's we the people, it's up to us. We have to do it ourselves. And David, what's amazing and what's thrilling to me as a reporter and so encouraging as a citizen is how many people in how many states have figured this out. People have said, we want elections to be fair. We're gonna stop partisan gerrymandering. We're gonna stop letting politicians draw the lines of election districts so they have more of their party in there so they can get reelected. We're gonna stop this business of unlimited money coming into our elections. We're gonna make it easier for people to register to vote. Yeah, we're gonna check them. We're gonna make sure that they're legitimate voters. They're citizens, they should be voting. But if they're eligible, then by God, we're gonna help them vote. And if we're gonna beat the big guys and the big money, maybe you're gonna need public funding of campaigns. The way you're talking, I should feel hope. Now I have an 18 year old son, he's in school, and he's telling me that his friends have no hope. They are completely down on the future, on America, on the economy. They don't like old people like us because they think we gave them a bad planet. Do you have hope? And do you feel that I, as a person watching you, should have hope? Yeah, David, I do. I do think you should have hope. But I also understand how those young people feel. Look, we've made a mess of it. Our generation, maybe not you and me, but our generation has made a mess of it. We've made a mess of the economy. We got an enormous concentration of wealth in the 1% or the 0.1% or the 0.001% of wealthy people connected with Wall Street and owners of the big corporations and really lousy low wages and a poor standard of living and lots of people worried about their future and whether or not they can send their kids to college, whether or not they're gonna have enough money for retirement, whether or not they can pay their rent or pay their mortgage. It's crazy. This is the richest country in the world. So we got that messed up and we got the political system messed up. So there's every reason for young people and older people as well to feel discouraged. But I'm encouraged because there are more and more people that I see every day, every month, every year that have awakened to that fact and said, by God, this is a democracy and it's up to us to fix it. And we can. David, 2018 was the best year for political reform in America in 50 years. Five states by popular vote adopted gerrymander reform. They took the power away from the politicians to draw the maps of election districts and took it over with a bipartisan or a citizen commission to make it fair, to level the playing field. You know, seven or eight states made it easier to vote. Four or five big cities like Phoenix and Denver and Baltimore uh, and Portland, Oregon adopted public funding of campaigns. I mean, there's just, this stuff is going on all over the place. Literally uh, an hour ago, before I got on with you, I just saw a report on ranked choice voting uh, and the push for ranked choice voting in Alabama, in Alaska, and in North Dakota. Now, those are not the states that would immediately come to mind if somebody said, is there reform going on somewhere? It's going on all over. People have the bug. And the great thing about democracy is that the, that the courage and the commitment of people who are doing something is contagious. I'm thrilled by this documentary, The Democracy Rebellion, that I made because it's not about me, it's about the people there. Please take a look at these stories, not because they're our stories, but because they show you real live people taking action and winning, winning for we the people, winning for democracy, winning for people power, winning for average Americans. It's happened. I could go on with you for an hour. It's a lot of fun to talk with you. You have a wonderful energy and, um, but I'm going to stop here because 
I feel for my audience that you've given me a sense of encouragement and a sense that I'd like to be a reporter if I'm young. Sounds pretty exciting. I don't know what you would tell your grandchildren, but we'll see when you respond. But I want to thank you for doing this with me and for being as passionate as you are and for not giving up on the country and democracy. And so thanks. I care. I think it's really important. I care and I'm engaged and I'm so lucky. To me, it's just been a natural commitment. I think it, maybe it's the way I was brought up. Maybe it's the way my mother, father loved me. Maybe it's my grandfather's idealism about wanting to be a country editor, but it's just been a great run. I love it.